I'm going to go straight to the Word. Um, so if you'll turn with me to the book of Colossians, and we're going to spend uh, this, week, this weekend in the book of Colossians. Thanks, Mandy. Um, and um, I, I was thinking about a title for, uh, for the session, these uh, sessions, and um, I think something like uh, Cool Conversations from Colossians. <laughs> As we advertised, we want to speak about the Lord Jesus, about the centrality of the Lord Jesus, and that's the message in the book of Colossians. And uh, I, I'm obviously never going to be able to, in I think seven sessions that we have, get through uh, all of Colossians, verse by verse, point by point, but uh, I've chosen uh, seven uh, themes, seven messages from here. And, um, and so let's begin in chapter 1, and I'll read the first 12 verses, um, and I'm going to speak from verses 9 through 12. So let's read Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit as it, has, as it, also, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with all the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. And so the, uh, the book begins with uh, a typical format as you find in, uh, in all of Paul's letters. Uh, he begins with uh, greetings um, and he begins with a prayer. And I want us to have a look at that prayer uh, this evening from verse 9. And so he begins by saying then that uh, he is praying First of all, I do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. The knowledge of his will. So Paul's desire for them and for us is that we may, in plain English, know the will of God that you may know the will of God. Now, the moment we begin to speak about the will of God, uh, we have all sorts of different ideas as to what is the will of God. And when we speak about the will of God, we invariably think about ministry, we think about major decisions in our lives. Uh, will I, uh, for those who are young people, will I follow this career or that career? Uh, will I marry this person? or that person, um, those kinds of major things. That, that, that is what we understand to be the will of God. Uh, but Paul is saying, no, the will of God uh, for us is something far more real, far more practical than that. And the, the thing is that we, we want to worry about those major decisions when in fact we're not making good decisions when it comes to the small day-to-day -day issues. 
And if we don't make and don't follow the will of God when it comes to the small things, when it comes to the moment by moment, day by day, um, walking before the Lord, then it doesn't matter how good or bad your decisions are concerning the, the big issues. And so it's important that we get the small things right first. And when we get those things right, then the other things will follow. And so he says then to us that he is praying that we may, uh, that we may be filled with the knowledge of his will. Not just knowing his will, but be filled with the knowledge of his will. In other words, uh, when, when it comes to knowing the will of God, we, we tend to to say, well, you know, it's, it's, it's a nebulous thing. It's something that uh, you t- struggle to get hold of and, 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 and it's a fleeting thing. So sometimes, yeah, I have an idea. This is what God wants me to do. But uh, then other times I, I'm not so sure about that. Um, and it's, it's sort of something which is somewhere in the top of our minds and uh, it's there and sometimes it's not there. But he says, I, I pray that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will that his will will fill your heart and your mind, that it is something that is not just a small little thing, but it it would become uh, one of the the core issues in your life, to know his will, to know his will. Because at the end of the day, unless I know his will, how can I please him? Because... It's not what I do that pleases him. It's whether I fulfill his will that pleases him. Uh, The thing that distinguished the Lord Jesus is the fact that he did the will of God. I delight to do thy will, O God. I delight to do thy will. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. What pleased the father about the Lord Jesus? that he obeyed the will of God. Now just think about that. When Jesus hears those words the first time out of heaven, where did that happen? At the Jordan, at his baptism. What had he done up to that point for the Father to say, I am pleased? with your life. I'm pleased with you. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Had he performed any miracles? Had he preached any messages? No. What did he do? He had lived for 30 years as a man. He had just lived his life working in his father's carpentry shop, helping his mother around the house, being a citizen, being a part of the community. He had just lived his life. But the father says, and, and, and we, 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 we apply that to the baptism. We say, well, that's what pleased. The, no, it wasn't just the baptism. The baptism was simply the, the, the end of a whole series of decisions that he made from the first time he was able to make a decision at whatever age that is. At 12, he's about his father's business. And so what pleased the father? What pleased the father was just the way that he was living his life. The way he was living his life. Now, it doesn't, I'm not suggesting, obviously, that, that ministry is not important. Of course, he had to now begin. But, but unless he had pleased the Father in those 30 years, just in the day-to-day issues, the way he did his job in the carpentry shop, the way that he lived in the context of his family, the way that he respected his mother and his father, those were the things that pleased God. But we say, well, God, I I want to do the big stuff. I want to be a missionary in Timbuktu. But God is saying, you better get your life right first. Because unless you get your life right, he is not pleased. And if he's not pleased, how is he going to send you? Oh, but I want to be a preacher. Everybody wants to be a preacher because you get to stand up here and look important. But unless you have pleased the Lord... 
how will he commission you to preach his word? And so that we may be filled with a knowledge of his will. And now he's going to tell us what the will of God is. And as I said, we don't have time to get into the details, but I want us just to get the overall picture. So in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now I'm going to come back to this word knowledge over and over over these, these next couple of days. That we may be filled with a knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now the moment we find that word knowledge, we say, well, it's knowledge about the Bible. It's knowledge about theology. But he says that you may be filled with a knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And obviously when he's speaking about knowledge, wisdom, understanding, surely he must be referring to doctrine. He must be referring to the Bible. But is that what he is speaking about? Is that what the context is all about? So let's go to verse 10. You you see that at at the end of verse 9, there is a semicolon. Is that what you call it here? Americans have different names for different things. In other words, what, what what is the semicolon there for? There is something that's going to follow. And what follows is an explanation of what he has just said. So he's going to tell us what the knowledge of his will and wisdom and spiritual understanding is all about. And here's the, here's the problem, here's the issue, here's the rub. That you may walk worthy of the Lord. What is the will of God in this context? That you may walk Worthy of the Lord. What understanding do I need? What wisdom do I need? I need understanding and wisdom so that I may walk worthy of the Lord. Can you see he's not speaking about uh, knowing the Bible or knowing theology. And, and of course those things are important. I, 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 I'm, I'm not minimizing those at all. I have I lay tremendous emphasis on knowing the scriptures and writing rightly dividing the word of truth. But folk, unless I have come to know God's will, where it the rubber meets the road, knowing the doctrine is going to be of no value whatsoever. It all begins here. It all began when Jesus began to live his life as a little boy. And he lives his life walking worthy of his father. Walking worthy of the Lord. What does it mean to walk worthy of the Lord? And maybe I can just summarize it this way. Walking in a way that honors him. But walking worthy of the price he paid to save me. That's where it begins. And that's where it ends. And I can know all knowledge. I can... I can <laughs> spend my, my life in ministry and in preaching and in helping people. But if I've not walked worthy of him, I've wasted my time. I need to walk worthy of the price that he paid. And what does it mean to walk? Well, it simply means to live. You see, here's the thing is that, that in most Christians and even Christians in, in, in good Bible-believing churches, there's a disconnect 
between what happens here between these four walls and what happens in the rest of my life. So I, I have this compartment which is my religious compartment and I, I, I know stuff and I pray and I put on the right face and I know what to do uh, in the context of the church. But when I live my life out there, it's a totally different thing. But where do I walk? I'm not, I don't walk here. I sit here. Both literally and figuratively. Remember in the book of Ephesians, Paul speaks about those three positions. That we are seated and we walk and we stand. We stand in the face of the enemy. We are seated in the presence of the Lord. This is where we're in the presence of the Lord. We sit here and we sit at his feet. Not at the feet of the preacher, but at his feet. And we worship him and we receive from him. Where do we walk in the book of Ephesians? And, and there's, by the way, a tremendous connection between Ephesians and Colossians. These two books uh, inform one another. They're very similar in many, many ways. Where do I walk? In Ephesians, before the Gentiles, before the world. That's where I walk. I don't walk here, unless you walk out on the preacher, but other than that, I sit here. I sit in his presence. I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But my walk is the moment we leave these premises. And that's where I need to walk worthy of the Lord. My testimony before the world needs to be one that is absolutely clear. And it's not one a testimony of what I say, but it's a testimony of how I live. That you walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him. Fully pleasing Him. We, we, we are all motivated and driven by the need to please people around us, whether they are our spouse or our parents or our peers or uh, our colleagues or whoever it is, we need the approval of people. We all do, some of us more than others. But there's only one approval, there's only one whose approval matters, and that is the Lord. Have we pleased him? You see, and again, we can, we can argue about the theology, we can argue about the Trinity and about this, the second coming and the pre-tribulation or mid-tribulation or post-tribulation rapture and uh, is Donald Trump the Antichrist or is he not the Antichrist? And, and the list goes on that with things we can argue about. But what pleases him is how I live how I conduct myself in the context of my family and in the context of the rest of my life. And that's the question I must ask. You see, and when we evaluate ourselves, and we do evaluate ourselves, and we are, we are called to do that when we come to the Lord's table, let a man examine himself. At the end of the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul says, therefore let a man examine him or examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. So there's a need for us to examine ourselves. There's a need for us to evaluate our progress. If, if we don't do that, we, we end up living an aimless life and we may find ourselves on the wrong track, but we just keep going because we don't stop for one moment to ask the question, whether am I in fact going in the right direction? And so the question we must ask ourselves, and we must ask ourselves regularly, is am I pleasing him? You see, we, we measure our spirituality again by so many things. By how much I pray, how much I read the Bible, how much I testify or witness, how much I uh, you know, preach, how much I know. But none of those things, understand what I'm saying, none of those things matter. 
There's one question I must answer, and that is, did I please and do I please him? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Do we please him? Most of you have worked this last week or been involved in some kind of secular pursuits in this last week. The question you must ask at the end of this week is, have I pleased the Lord in the way that I did my job? It's not whether your boss is happy or not happy. It's easy to pull the wool over the boss's eyes and put on a good show. But it's whether the Lord is pleased. It's not whether you're pleased. It's whether the Lord is pleased. And it's not whether he is a little pleased. Fully pleasing him. Fully pleasing him. And, and at, the, at the end of the day, when I make decisions, the decisions we must ask are that, we, that, uh, that must be based on, will this please the Lord? Not, 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 can I get away with this? We, we, we have a term in, uh, in business, it, it's good enough. When it comes to doing our jobs, you know, as long as it's good enough. The question is not whether it's good enough, the question is, have I fully pleased him? Because that's the only way I can walk worthy of the price he paid for me. And folk, we must ask this question. We must ask it at the end of every day. We must ask it during the day. Have I pleased the Lord? And as a preacher, when I go home tonight, there's one question. And folk in our assembly know that I don't care whether you think I preached a good message or not. You can slap me on the back or you can hit me in the face. It doesn't matter. There's one question that I have to answer for myself and my own heart when I go to bed tonight. Did I please the Father? Did I please him? That's the only question that matters. Whether the elders of this assembly are happy with you or not, is not the question. Now, it doesn't mean that we walk in rebellion, but if you're pleasing the Lord, you will please the elders. But you see, we try and please men, and we try and do what men want us to do, and that may not be what the Lord wants us to do. I'm not inciting rebellion. I'm not inciting, in in any sense, walking independently of one another. But if I'm pleasing him, I will be doing the right thing every step of the way. And so Paul says, I pray that you may know his will. And his will is number one, that you walk worthy of him. His will is number two, that you fully please him. And now he's going to explain what that means. Being fruitful in every good work. Being fruitful in every good work. What is good work? Giving money to the poor? Preaching? What is good work? Whatever your hand finds to do. Well, in the context of the passage... The good work is doing the will of the Father. So I say, you know, I, I, you know, preaching is a good is a good work, is 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 it not? Yeah, that's a good work. But if He wants me to be praying, I say, no, I'm not going to pray. I'm going to preach. Am I doing good work? Now the work may be good, but it's not the good work I should be doing at that moment. So I can only do the good work when I'm doing his will. So is it good work to go to work on Monday? Yes, it is. Because that's the will of God. You say, well, how do I know it's the will of God? Well, he says, if you don't work, you can't eat. So it's God's will for you to go to work. 
That's good work. You see, because again, we say, well, that's, that's working for my boss and, you know, he's not a nice person. No, it's the will of God that we earn our bread by the sweat of our brow. That's the declared will of God. And when you, do, when you earn your bread and when you live, do your job, you're doing the will of God. But come Sunday morning, you say, well, I have to go to work because I can get double time or triple time. Is that the will of God? No, I don't believe that that's the will of God. What's the will of God for you on Sunday morning? To be in the meeting. So it's not that hard to know the will of God. And the good work is doing the right thing at the right time. Doing the right thing at the right time. And so Paul says, I pray that you may know the will of God. That you may know the will of God moment by moment, step by step. What should I be doing at this time? What should I be doing at that time? What does God want me to do? How does he want me to live? You see, because we, we get involved in theory and in theology and in doctrine and in philosophy, which he'll, 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 we'll come to that word uh, later on, maybe tomorrow. We get involved in those things. But he's asking us to live in a way that pleases him. Because it's in living that he is glorified. You see, worship, and I'm sure you know these things. I'm just reminding you, I'm, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know this weekend. I'm just going to remind you of things that you do know. Worship is not what happened in the first 15 minutes of this meeting. We're still worshiping right now. I'm worshiping him by preaching. You're worshiping by the way that you receive his word. Now, if you don't receive his word and you rebel against his word, are you worshiping? No, you're not. When you go to work, it's worshiping him by the way we do our jobs. When you relate to your family, that is worship. Every detail of my life is worship if I'm doing it to his glory. But you see, we're so selfish and self-centered that I live for my ends and purpose and for my glory. And it's all about me and I. But when my focus is on him, and that's the, the message of the book, is that Christ is all in all. He is central to not the body of Christ only, but he is central to my life. And the way I do my job is worship. The way I keep my home is worship. The way that I recreate is worship. Really? So when you're watching a TV show, you shouldn't be? Is that worship? No. So you have to ask your question when in watching this show, does that glorify God? Odd question. Now clearly God wants for us to relax. He wants for us to rest. He wants for us to sleep. He wants for us to eat. These are all things that he has made for us. And we need those things in order to function. But the problem is when I sleep when I shouldn't be sleeping, like right now, and I don't see anyone, so that's good. <laughs> when I eat more than I should be eating, that's not glorifying him. And so every detail matters. So let me, let, let me move on. So here's, here's, the, here's the wonderful thing, is that as I please him, being fruitful in every good work, and I'm not going to speak about being fruitful. You know, you can preach that whole message for yourself, the, uh, Jesus coming to the tree and the tree has no fruit on it and he curses the fig tree 
um, the, the husbandman who comes to the, to the tree and it doesn't bear and uh, he says, well, you know, chop it out. And the, the husbandman says, well, give it another year. You know, we, we understand all of those things that need to be fruitful in every good work. And increasing in the knowledge of God. So he begins with the knowledge of his will and now he comes to the knowledge of God, knowing him, knowing him. And that really is one of the driving forces in Paul's life, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, but also being made conformable to him in his death that I may know him. How do I know him? And we, we don't have the time to get into the, the detail of, of that. I know him in his word. I also know him by communion, communing and in fellowship with him. And I'm not going to speak about mysticism now. That's another, another whole story. But I want you to see the context. You see, here's the problem. We, we read and we have a preconceived idea as to what it says. I overheard a conversation last night about proofreading. And I could relate to that. Because it's very hard for me or probably any author to proofread his own stuff. Because he assumes that he knows what is written there. He doesn't read the detail. And so there are blatant mistakes, but he can't see them. Because he's reading with a preconceived idea of what is there. Without seeing what is really there. And we do the same with the word of God. So, so when we come to this idea of the knowledge of God, of knowing God, we have a preconceived idea. We immediately go to the, how do I know God? I know him through his word. I know him through the revelation of the spirit. That's how I know God. But is that what he is speaking about here? Is that what the context is dealing with? And I want you to see what he is saying. He is saying that I'm praying that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. How does, what does the context say? In what context does the knowledge of God come? As I walk worthy of him, as I please him, as I'm being fruitful in every good work. In that process, I increase in knowing him. I know that doesn't make sense. How do I know him by living the Christian life? Doesn't make sense. You, you, you know him by studying the scripture. You know him by the revelation that comes by the spirit. As you walk in the way, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. You see, we want revelation separate from life. Like the mystics of Eastern religion, we want to go and sit on the mountain and we want somehow enlightenment to come. God to somehow reveal to me himself. But as I please him, as I obey him, doing the things that he asks me to do, he reveals himself. Now, obviously not separate from his word, but his spirit brings to my remembrance his word. And I begin to see in daily living, I begin to understand him. He begins to make sense in a real way. Because you see, here's the problem, is, is, is our knowledge of him tends to be mystical and theoretical and is pie in the sky. 
and, and he's like this, and he's, you know, he's omniscient, and he's omnipotent, and he's uh, three in one as a trinity, and, and, and all of those, those things. But he's known to us as we obey him, and as we follow his direction. He reveals to us not just the next step, but he reveals himself to us. The disciples on the road to, to Emmaus, they have this conversation with him. They don't, don't know who they're, they're talking to. They get to Emmaus, and what do they do? They obey him. They break bread. And as they break bread, doing a very common thing. And I'm, I don't know that in breaking bread, it was meaning the Lord's Supper. It may be, have been part of that process. But they're having a meal. And as they're just doing fellowship, he is known to them. Doing a very common, everyday thing, he reveals himself. As we obey him, doing ordinary things, he reveals himself. As long as what I'm doing is in the context of worship, serving him. You see, if I have this compartmental thing and I've left him behind here or left him in my closet and I'm now living my life and I'm just following my own ideas and my own things and I'm you know, driven by my own agenda... I'm not going to see him in my workplace. But as I commune with him, as I take him with me when I go to work, as I take him with me as I deal with my day-to-day -day issues, as I take him with me as I uh, do the yard work, as I uh, clean the house, as I do these things, he reveals himself to us in those everyday, day-to-day -day situations. Now verse 11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Now again, when we see these words, we think about the power of the Spirit, we think about miracles, we think about doing mighty signs and wonders. And, but notice what he, again what he is saying, and I'm running out of time, so I'm rushing. But strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. You'll find a connection with that in Ephesians. For what purpose? For all patience and long-suffering. The word patience there, endurance. When do I need endurance? When I'm having a good time. I need endurance when things are hard. You don't need endurance to have a walk on the side of, by the beach unless you walk too far. You don't need endurance to eat ice cream. Well, I don't. You need endurance when things are hard. You need long-suffering when people, because the word long-suffering is invariably connected with people. When people aren't nice, that's when you need long-suffering. And he's saying that I'm praying that you may be strengthened with all of the power of God to endure, to be long-suffering with your husband, with your wife, with your boss, with your unsaved neighbors. But that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where we need the power. Yeah, we need power to read this Bible. We need power to pray. We need power to preach. But we need power to deal with adversity in life. And the last message I preached here last year was a warning that troublesome times are coming. And we have entered those times. The events of these last few weeks 
what's happening on the stock exchanges of the world. We've entered those times. We need endurance. We need long-suffering. And we need to be endued with power from on high. And I'm abusing that scripture. But it, the, the scripture here is saying that I may be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Folk, we need to be strengthened with might, with all glorious power to deal with life today. And it's going to get worse and worse. It's not going to get easier. You listen to the financial commentators and they're all trying to say, don't worry about it, the stock market will come right. Folk, it's not going to get any better. Yeah, the stock market might, might recover to some extent. But things are getting worse and worse in the world in which we're living. Jesus is coming, and he's very, very close. We're seeing the birth pangs, and whether you believe in a pre-tribulation or mid-tribulation rapture, that's not the point. The point is that the tribulation is, is near. And if that is near, then Jesus is at the very, very door. We need endurance. We need long-suffering. But it's not just long-suffering in trying just to bear it. Ah, you know, I'm patient. I'm putting up with my situation. With joy. Patience and long-suffering with joy. And folks, we need that joy of the Lord. Joy of the Lord is your strength. We know that. And again, the context is the way that we are walking. If we need to be walking worthy of Him, and if I'm if I'm living my life and I'm beset by difficulties and my my pension has gone down the drain because the stock market has fallen another two thousand points today or whatever it is, and they won't let me back into America because. of the virus, yeah, well, you know, I'm just being patient, I'm putting up with it, you know. No, with joy. You have a difficult marriage, long suffering with joy. You have a hard job, you have a difficult boss, endurance and long suffering with joy. With joy. Well, because, because anybody in the world can learn to put up with situations and to deal with tribulation and difficulty with a long face. But it's doing so with joy that makes the difference. That is the testimony and that, makes, and, and that causes us to walk worthy of him. If we put up with our trials and our difficulties and we complain and moan but we put up with them, how does that glorify him? But when we're able to do that with joy, that is walking worthy of him. That is glorifying him. That is fully pleasing him. And obviously when I'm speaking about joy, I'm not speaking about frivolity or just empty uh, you know, empty um, emotion, but a deep-seated joy. The apostles rejoiced, rejoiced because they were counted worthy to suffer for his sake. You see, again, we've, we, we're living in, a, in the Western world. We're living in a narcissistic society. It's about enjoying yourself, about a pleasure. It's about a great life, about everything being wonderful and being fulfilling. We're, we're going to need to learn to endure, to be long-suffering, and to have joy in the Lord because he has saved us and he's coming. And he's going to take us home. We need that joy. I'm concerned about Christians who claim to be born again. And yet the moment trials come, it's just dark clouds and long faces and, and, and uh, you know, complaining and moaning and, and, and frustration and anger. And they say, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being patient. I'm putting up with it. No, it's with joy. 
when we lose, love, lose loved ones. Yes, we mourn, but there's a joy because they're in the presence of the Lord and we will see them again. When the stock exchange falls and when coronavirus spreads right through the world and, and who knows how it's going to happen and how it's going to play out from here, but certainly every day looks worse and worse than the previous day. But when we're able to face those things with joy, because we know that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And then let me close quickly with verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Giving thanks to the Father. In what context? Again, in the context of endurance or patience, and long-suffering, joy, and thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, that you're putting us through these issues. How can I thank God when the virus takes my loved ones? And that may well happen. I don't know. How can I be thankful? Thankful because they're in the presence of Jesus. I'm thankful because he is using these things to shape me into the image of his dear son. Every trial, every tribulation, every problem that comes my way, thank you, God, that all things work together for the good to them that love him and are the called according to his purpose. This is the will of God for us. You know, you, 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 we want to read books and we want, you, you, you know, hope to find some kind of long thesis about how do you find the will of God? What is the will of God? The will of God is that we live lives that glorify him. It's as simple as that. Amen.